Ron Conway Spirited Seminar Series. Uh, today we have uh, with us our distinguished uh, speaker, Professor Francesco Brenti from uh, the University of Rome, Italy. And uh, Professor Brenti is, uh, is a very well-known name in the area of uh, computational commutative, uh, com combinatorial commutative algebra and uh, I would say theoretical computer sciences which is a very, very much in fashion area in the area of uh, mathematics. And uh, Pro Professor Brinti is, uh, is a PhD student of Professor Richard Stanley, who is the founder of this area, somehow combinatorial commutative algebra. And uh, over to you, Professor Francisco. Okay, well, thank you very much for this uh, uh kind introduction and um, thank you for the invitation to speak here. I'm, I'm happy to do so. So I will talk about graphs, uh, stable permutations and uh, Kuntz algebra automorphisms. And this is a uh, joint work with uh, Roberto Conti and uh, Gleb Nienaschev. So here is my uh, plan. So I plan first to talk about Kuntz algebras, then I'll talk about stable permutations and explain their connections to uh, Kuntz algebras. Then I'll talk about our main result, uh, which is this uh, uh, characterization of stable permutations in terms of graphs. Then I'll talk about some applications of this main result. And then if I have time, I'll talk about some open problems. So Kuntz algebra, so you take a Hilbert space H and you take N isometries, S1, Sn, that satisfy these relations. Si star Sj is delta Ij times the identity. And then the sum for I that goes from one up to N of Si, Si star is the identity. Now, of course, you have to prove that such an object exists, and, and this can be done in several ways. So such an object does exist, and uh, it depends only on n. And the Kuntz algebra on is the sister algebra generated by these isometries and their adjoints. So S1, Sn, S1 star, Sn star. Now, you see that because of this first relation, so how should I think of this Kuntz algebra? It's going to be linear combinations with coefficients in C, these are the elements, and then a monomial in these symbols, Si and then Sj star. So some monomial in these symbols, but you see that even though the algebra is not commutative, uh, because if I have a star to the left of an S, uh, it disappears, it becomes either zero or one, in practice, these monomials are all a monomial in the S's times a monomial on the S star. So that's what I should think of, a linear combination of these elements. And then, sorry, and then uh, I, of course you have to take the sister algebra. So you have to take the closure. So you take uh, Cauchy sequences in these elements. But in practice, uh, this is a very combinatorial object. So in practice, you work with a finite linear combination of these monomials, and then you just go to the limit, which usually gives uh, no problems. So this is the Kuntz algebra, and it's well known that there is a bijective correspondence between the unitary elements of the algebra, so elements uh, whose star is the inverse, and endomorphisms of ON. And this is very simple. Uh, if you have U, you just multiply on the left by U, and that's going to be your endomorphism. And the inverse maps, if you have a lambda, you construct this element, some i from 1 up to n, lambda si, si star. And you can check with these relations that that's going to be a unitary element. So now here, um, we have these monomials. And uh, so uh, somehow, I, I guess, OK. So for uh, alpha 1, alpha k, uh, sequence of uh, numbers, each one from 1 up to n, I will just 
take this notation s alpha yes so i'm not sure if sorry want to sorry it. sorry uh, please continue okay uh, so I will define just for convenience S alpha to be the, the monomial S alpha one, S alpha two, S alpha K. So where alpha is some sequence of integers, each one from one up to N. So now inside this, uh, this algebra, uh, I have these uh, particular elements, S alpha, S beta star, where alpha and beta are uh, both of length K. Okay. So this is the main thing. Otherwise, this would be the, the whole algebra. But here I'm only taking sequences of k integers. So k, uh, if you want, you can think of degree k, degree k in the s and degree k in the s star. So now this spans a subalgebra. And one can see that this is really isomorphic to the sister algebra of complex matrices of size n to the k. And you can see this because this monomial corresponds to the matrix that has entry one in position alpha beta and zero elsewhere. So linear combination of these are the same thing as matrices of size n to the k. And of course, this is also mn tensor mn, et cetera, k times. So you have this subalgebra isomorphic to matrices of size n to the k. n is fixed, but k goes from one to infinity. So these subalgebras are in a natural way one inside the other because you can multiply by one and the degree formally goes up by one. So you can take the limit and you get the uh, inductive uh, limit sister algebra, which is called Fn, known as the core UHF subalgebra, which is isomorphic to tensor product of Mn with itself uh, uh, infinitely many copies. So there is one important endomorphism here uh, denoted by phi, and phi of x uh, sends x to the sum i from 1 up to n of si x si star. OK, so this restricts to an endomorphism of fn. And this is very simple if you consider the tensor product picture, it just take the L, takes the element x and shifts it by one to the right. So shifts everything to the right. So you have this subalgebra, uh, as I said, isomorphic to complex matrices of this size. And of course, in here, you have diagonal matrices. Uh, uh, Professor Francisca? Uh, yes. What can we say about S alpha here? Oh, um, S alpha, this is just my shorthand notation for a monomial in these generators. Okay. I'm not so sure if a, I okay. understand your question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Sure. So um, you have in here the sister subalgebra of, you know, essentially diagonal matrices. Namely, now you look only at those monomials S alpha, S alpha star. So not only the same number of generators in the S and in the S star, but the same sequence. So you see that this corresponds to the matrix that has one in position alpha, alpha, and zero elsewhere. So the span of this is really the diagonal matrices. So this is isomorphic to the algebra of diagonal matrices of size n to the k. And again, you can take the corresponding inductive limit and you get an algebra dn. So you have these three objects. dn sits inside fn, which sits inside on. So now Kuntz uh, decided to define this group, which he called the reduced vial group of the Kuntz algebra in this way. So it's defined in a way kind of similar to the way you define the vial group of a, of a Lie group. So you take the automorphisms of ON, which leave both these subalgebras uh, uh, invariant. So they map Fn to Fn and Dn to Dn. And you mod out 
by the automorphisms which fix the diagonal subalgebra pointwise. So this is some group and uh, the hope was that this group would contain enough information about the Kuhn's algebra um, and at the same time be easier to study. So the Kuhn's algebra was introduced in 1977 and this is a paper uh, from 1980 where Kuhn's uh, defines this uh, reduced Weyl group for the first time. And it's a very short paper, as you see, uh, typewritten. And in the last page, he says, the classification of all automorphisms of ON, which leave D and F invariant, modulo lambda DU, is a combinatorial problem and should be possible. So I have to say that I give credit to the guy because in 1980, with the exception of a few enlightened places around the world, combinatorics was considered an area of mathematics with essentially uh, no connections to anything else. But here is an eminent mathematician who really thinks that this object coming from a very infinite and, and uh, uh, very wild object is a combinatorial problem and should be possible. So indeed, uh, so I'll, I'll come to this. Of course, I'm a combinatorialist, so I wouldn't be working on this if there wasn't combinatorial. So he was right. Uh, very briefly, so the Kuhn's algebra arises uh, in a number of areas, including quantum field theory, uh, representation theory, K theory, and dynamical systems, and has a number of, of remarkable properties. Sorry. Um... Professor uh, Francisco, yes. could, could I ask, uh, could you uh, recall what, what is the Kuhn's algebra? So it's, how is sure. it related to the reduced sure. file of ON? Or so, is it... Okay, so the Kuhn's algebra is the algebra generated by, if you wish, you know, just this n Oh, right. So, and okay, okay, I got it. Thanks. Subject Thanks. to these uh, generators. And then, right. you know, you're interested in the automorphisms. So they are difficult to describe. Right. So the symmetries of this structure and his idea was to take this particular subgroup of automorphisms that fix these two algebras. Uh, I mean, not fix, leave them invariant. Right. And, uh, and fix the diagonal ones uh, uh, pointwise. Okay. And how is this related to uh, the, so, okay. So the elements come from the Kuhn's algebra, right? Yes. Okay, got yes. it. They are going to be linear combinations of those monomials. Right, got it. Thanks. Thanks so much. Sure. Okay, so I was saying it has a number of remarkable properties. It's a kind of fractal object. So I, I give two as, a, as, a, as an example. So if you take the O2 algebra corresponding to n equals two, then every other Kuhn's algebra is a subalgebra of that. So they're all one inside the other. And if you take the tensor product of O2 with itself, you end up with something that's still isomorphic to O2. Okay. So here are some references. Uh, this is the paper where Kuhn's first defined these algebras. Uh, this is the paper where he first investigated relations between the Kuhn's algebra and K theory. And this is uh, the paper where he first investigated the uh, relations between the Kuhn's algebra and dynamical systems. And this is the first paper where uh, combinatorics was really brought in. Uh, Conti Zimanski in 2011, and I'll talk about this. So this is the starting point of this paper for this combinatorial investigation that I'm going to talk about. Uh, they really, uh, could pinpoint the elements of this reduced Weyl group as combinatorial objects. And uh, here are some more references. Uh, this is paper, these are papers that study this uh, restricted Weyl group uh, uh, from an algebraic uh, point of view, mainly. So now let me go to stable permutations. So, I take two positive integers, n and m, 
I take a permutations U in SN and V in SM. SN here is usually the symmetric group, so all bijections uh, from the integers from one up to N in themselves. And I define a new permutation, which are called the tensor product of the two. And this is a permutation of the Cartesian product of the integers from one to N with those from one to M. And I define it in this very natural way, U tensor V. Uh, what does it do to a pair IJ? It's U of I, V of J. So U acts on the first coordinate and V acts on the second coordinate. And it's a very simple observation that if you have u u prime in SN and v v prime in SM, then u tensor v times u prime tensor v prime is going to be u u prime tensor v v prime. So now I will denote by one the identity of the symmetric group. And I will take a permutation of n to the r by which I mean Cartesian product of the integers from one up to n with themselves r times. So a permutation of this hypercube, discrete hypercube, and I take a non-negative integer k. And I will define another element, another permutation, psi sub k of u. This is a permutation of a bigger hypercube, n to the r plus k. I will define it in this way. So it's a product of permutations. I think I'll start from the rightmost one. So I multiply permutations as composition of functions. So this will be the first one that you apply. So you have one tensor one tensor one k times tensor u. So these permutations acts on, so it's a permutation of this hypercube acts on uh, r plus k tuples of integers, each one from one up to n, it's the identity on the first k coordinates, and on the last r coordinates, it acts as u. Then I continue, I shift u to the right, to the left, excuse me, by one. So I would have, here I didn't write it, but one tensor one tensor one k minus one times, tensor u, tensor one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera until I get to one tensor one tensor u, and then k minus two copies of one tensor one. And finally, one tensor u, tensor one tensor one tensor one, k minus one times. Now I shift u again to the left, but now it becomes u inverse. So now I have u inverse, tensor one tensor one tensor one, and now I move back to the right. So I would have uh, one, I didn't write it one tensor u inverse, tensor one, tensor one, tensor one, k minus one times, et cetera, et cetera, until you get to one tensor one, tensor one, k minus one times, u inverse, tensor one, and finally, one tensor one, tensor one, tensor u inverse. Okay, so it's this uh, complicated product constructed from u and uh, the number k. So you could define it uh, also inductively. You could say, well, I take psi k minus one of u, I tensor with one on the right, and then I conjugate by this permutation. One tensor one tensor one tensor u. And this is my c sub k and psi sub zero, I defined as u inverse. So let me give you a, uh, an example. Take n equals four and r is two. So this is uh, a square. It's a four by four square, discrete square, and I take k equals one. And for my permutation, I take a very simple one. I take this simple transposition that exchanges one, two, and two, three. And I want to compute psi one of u. This is going to be a permutation of four cubes, so of the three-dimensional discrete cube of size four. And I want to compute this permutation on the triple one to three, on the point one to three. So if I look at my definition for k equals one, it's going to be one tensor u inverse times u inverse tensor one times one tensor u 
apply to one, two, three. Okay, so I rewrite the first two. I apply one tensor U to one, two, three. One is the identity, so one remains. U applied to two, three is going to be one, two. So this becomes one, two. Now I apply U inverse tensor one to one, one, two. U inverse apply to one, one. One, one is a fixed point of this permutation. So that's one, one. And the identity on two, of course, gives me two. Now, finally, I have to apply one tensor U inverse. One, of course, leaves the one here. U inverse applied to one, two, gives me back two, three. So in the end, this permutation of the three-dimensional cube of size four sends the point one, two, three to one, two, three. So let me give you a slightly uh, more complicated example. So let's take a, a square of sides nine. And as a permutation, I'll take a, a three cycle. So this sends one, two, 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 three, two, three to five, nine, and five, nine back to one, two. So permutation of the discrete square of size nine. And I want to compute psi sub four of u. So this is going to act on four plus two, the six dimensional discrete cube of size nine. So I take a point in there, say five, nine, one, two, nine, six. And I want to see what happens when I apply psi sub four of u. So I have to apply u to the last two coordinates, which are nine, six. 96 is a fixed point, so nothing happens. 96 remains here and U moves to the left. Now I apply U to 29. 29 is a fixed point, nothing happens. So 29 remains there and I shift U to the left. Now I have to apply U to 12. U sends 12 to 23. So this one two becomes 23 and U shifts to the left. So one, two became two, three, U shifted. So now I have to apply U to nine, two. Nine, two is a fixed point, so nothing happens. U shifts to the left, but now it changes to U inverse. So now I have U inverse on the first two coordinates. U inverse sends five, nine to two, three. So that changes to two, three, and U inverse shifts to the right. U inverse on apply to 3, 2, 3, 2 is a fixed point, so nothing happens. I shift it to the right. U inverse applied to 2, 3 gives me 1, 2. So this changes to 1, 2. U inverse shifts to the right. Now I have to apply U inverse to 2, 9. That's a fixed point. Nothing happens. I shift it again to the right. I apply it to 9, 6. Nothing happens. And this is my final result. So this permutation sends this point of the six dimensional discrete hypercube of size nine to this other point. So now here's the uh, uh, key definition. So you take a permutation of this discrete hypercube of dimension R n to the R. And I say that U is stable if there is a positive integer k so that psi sub k of u is a permutation of this hypercube, which is one dimension smaller, tensor one. In other words, I am saying that psi k of u can be written as v tensor one, as something tensor one. That's all I'm saying. And uh, there is a small typo here. Uh, so it should be, this should be true for K and all integers greater than or equal to K. So there should be a K so that this is true for K, for K plus one, for K plus two, et cetera. So if that happens, I say stable and the least such K, I call the rank of this uh, permutation. It turns out it's, it's a, a fact that if there is such a V, it's necessarily psi K minus one. So if it's stable at rank K, then this V is exactly the previous uh, psi that you have computed. 
So what do stable permutations have to do with Kuhn's algebras? So there is this result, as I said, by Conti Zimanski, uh, I guess it should be 2011, that says that the reduced value group, which we you know, just defined, equal, I mean, yes, there should be, there is a bijection between the elements of this group and lambda u for u stable. So the elements of this group are exactly permutations of the discrete hypercube of dimension r and side n for some r positive that are stable. You take all those permutations, you take the endomorphisms associated to those permutations, they are going to be automorphisms, they are going to be in this quotient, and that's all of them. So the group is exactly this object. So indeed, it's now a combinatorial problem because it's not so clear which permutations are stable. So that's what you would like to understand. So let me give an example of uh, stability. So take this permutation that we were looking at before. Uh, I'm looking at the square of sides four, a four by four square. And I take as u this transposition that switches one, two, and two, three. And I'm going to compute the psi k of u. So this is a permutation on the k plus two dimensional hypercube. And I apply this permutation to the point one, 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 two. So we now have a little bit of practice. So let's see what happens. I have to apply u to the last two entries. Well, u changes one, two to two, three. Okay. Now I switch, I shift, excuse me, u to the left. And I again have one, two, because one, two became two, three. So one, two applied becomes two, three, et cetera, all the way to this position. One, two becomes two, three. So I'm going to get one, two, three, 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 three. And then I have the rest of my product to apply, the one that uses U inverse. Okay. So now I have to apply U inverse on the first two positions. Well, U inverse of one, two is two, three. So that becomes a two, three. I shift to the right. And now I'm going to find three, three, because this changed. 3, 3 is a fixed point, so nothing happens. Goes to the right, 3, 3 is a fixed point, nothing happens, and so on until the end. So the end of this computation is 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. So this permutation is not stable. Now, uh, it's natural to, to see what stability means uh, for the permutation of rank 1. And uh, I'm only going to look at uh, the two-dimensional cube, uh, so the, the square, the discrete square. And one can see that you is stable of rank one, essentially by definition, uh, if and only if one tensor u and u tensor one commute as permutations of the discrete cube. So. Now, the, the young bastard equation uh, is this equation. is u tensor 1, 1 tensor u, u tensor 1 equals 1 tensor u, u tensor 1, 1 tensor u. Now, permutations of the discrete square, uh, which are solutions of the young bastard equation, are called the set theoretic solutions. And there is quite a literature on them. And no characterization of this permutation is known. So being a stable of rank one is a kind of uh, simpler analog of the Jan Buster equation. In Excuse fact, me, uh, yes? Sir, how uh, you are defining multiplication in these tensors? Well, okay, so this is what I uh, said at the beginning. So, well, I, I actually, no, let me, let me be more precise. So U is a permutation of N square. One is the identity of Sn. So this is a permutation of n cube. Okay, it does something on the discrete cube of sides n. This is also a permutation of n cube, and I just multiply them as permutations. So in particular, this would not be u tensor u. 
because this acts on the first two coordinates, but this acts on the first one. So they don't commute. So this is simply some permutation of n cubed, another one, and I multiply them. I, I'm, I'm not sure that I uh, understood your question, though. OK, so thank you. Sure. So, um, so it is a kind of analog of the Ambassador equation. Um, here are some uh, references on set theoretical solutions uh, to the Ambassador equation um, paper where they were first uh, posed as a problem. So, as I said, you would like to understand stable permutations uh, as explicitly as you can. Uh, at the very least, you would like to uh, count them, to enumerate them. So, here's a one of the first results that we uh, found. Um, and so, of course, the, the simplest permutation that you can think of is a transposition. So I'm going to look at the square, dimension two, discrete square of sides n. I take two points in this square, ij and ab. And I take the simple transposition that switches these two. And then one can show that the following conditions are equivalent. One is that u is stable. One is that u is stable of rank one. And the other one is that ai is disjoint from vj. So of course, this is as explicit as you can hope for. Uh, so in this case, you have a very satisfactory answer. You just look at the two cycle and you can tell it's stable or it's not stable. Uh, of course, uh, an important you know, operation among permutations is product. And you can see easily that if you take two stable permutations and you multiply them together, they are not going to remain stable. But this is true under an additional hypothesis. So if you take, again, I'm only talking about the discrete square dimension two, take uv permutations of n square, u stable of rank at most s, v stable of rank at most r, and suppose that one tensor u commutes with v tensor one. Then yes, then the product is stable of rank at most r plus s. So these two results already produce quite a lot of stable permutations because you can take all the stable transpositions that, that are compatible and multiply them. Um, and this condition uh, comes up so often that we gave it a name. So we said, if u and v satisfy this equation, we say that u is compatible with v. And this is, the paper where these uh, results appear. And what instead I'm talking about today has just been accepted for advances in applied mathematics. So now let me talk about uh, the main result. So graphs and stable permutations. So I'm going to describe uh, an operation that so starts with a direct graph on vertex set the t minus one dimensional discrete hypercube. So the vertices of this graph are exactly the vertices of the discrete hypercube or dimension t minus one and sides n. And u is a permutation of the hypercube of one dimension higher, n to the t. And I define two operators, r sub u and l sub u, that take a, such a graph as input and produce another direct graph. So let me show you how this works. So suppose you have a directed edge from A to B in your graph. Now you take a Z integer from one to the N. So remember the graph is a graph on points, vertices of the hypercube. So these really are T minus one tuples of numbers. Okay, so these are T minus one tuples. You take a Z, stick it to the right. And now here you have T numbers. 
you have a point of the hypercube of dimension one higher. To take AZ and BZ, apply U to both of them, and then apply this operator F1, which simply means FI means uh, forget the ith coordinate. So you just delete the ith coordinate. So here, take Z, put it on the right, apply U, and forget the first coordinate. You are going to get two points of this hypercube of dimension t minus one, and that's going to be an edge in your new graph. So for every directed edge in the old graph, and that is z, you get a new edge in the next graph. So uh, one observation that's useful to make is that if uh, this is a loop, if a equals b, then a z equals a z. You apply u to both, you apply f1 to both, you still get a loop. So this construction uh, takes loops to loops. So for this reason, we essentially don't care about loops. L of u is defined in a similar way. You take a directed edge, two points on your discrete hypercube, stick a z on the left now, apply u, and then forget the last coordinate. OK, so that's going to be my other graph. Now again, for u, permutation of the t-dimensional hypercube, I define uh, two graphs, delta 0 and delta 0 sharp. So what is delta 0? Vertex set of all these graphs is the t minus 1 dimensional hypercube of side n. And when do I put an edge from a to b? So remember, these are t minus 1 tuples of integers. I put an edge between a and b. Essentially, if you inverse can change these last coordinates into these. So if there is some z and some w, so that this is true. So in practice, this means that you inverse can change these last coordinates into these in some, some way. And similarly, define delta zero sharp. If you inverse can change these first coordinates into these, can change these A coordinates into the Bs somehow. OK, so the main result is the following. You take a permutation of the t-dimensional hypercube, t greater than 1, then u is stable if and only if there is some positive integer m, so that you start with delta 0 u, and you apply this operator r u inverse m times, and you start with this uh, graph delta 0 sharp of u, apply this operator LU m times, and you get only loops. And then, of course, from then on, if you were to continue, there will still be only loops. And this is characterization of when it's stable. So if it's stable, this happens. If this happens, then it's stable. So I will give a uh, sketch of the proof. Now uh, I'll see uh, how much detail I can give because I also want to go to the applications of these graphs. So with these graphs, we could, we could prove things that we were unable to prove uh, in other ways. But so anyway. Uh, uh, may I ask one question here? Of course. Uh, uh, this M will work for both uh, graphs. I mean, this M will be fixed one. So I'm not sure that I understood your question. Maybe the audio was not so great. Could you please repeat it? OK. So I'm asking about this M, which you get yes. here in, yes. in some positive integer. So my mm -hmm. question is that this M will work for both graphs. I mean, at the same time, you will get the uh, uh, loops in, 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 in those graphs. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So if it's stable, you get an M that works for mm -hmm. both. Both, okay. And exactly. And if you have an M that works for both, then it's stable. OK, are there some example of where uh, these m's are different yes yes okay. so you mm -hmm. can have examples in which for example uh, start from delta zero after one mm -hmm. iteration you have only loops but here mm -hmm. maybe you need two or three 
Okay, and in that in that case, your u is not stable. No, 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 no. In that case, you would say m is three, because if after one iteration uh, mm -hmm. you get only loops, then if you continue, you still get only loops. So, okay. Okay. So you would say, okay, three works because uh, after three iterations you got only loops. So uh, even after one, okay, but after three mm -hmm. you do, and here you also do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So very briefly, uh, you start by defining two numbers, n and then sharp. So these are defined from psi k of u. And they are defined in this way. If there is some integer n of u, so that for all k is greater than or equal to n of u, this permutation does not change the last t minus one coordinates, then you take that number. If this never happens, then you say, okay, plus infinity. So you define this number and it has the property if it exists, that from this number upward, this size of k is unable to change the last t minus one coordinates. They will always remain the same. And there is a dual definition, which is very similar. You don't want that it changes the first t minus one coordinates, and you don't have size of k, you have something similar defined in a similar way. So you have these two numbers and you can prove this uh, result. You take a permutation of the t-dimensional discrete hypercube, then u is stable if and only if both of these are finite. And if they are finite, you actually get a bound on the rank. The rank is at most the sum of these numbers plus t minus one, and at least the maximum of these two. Okay, so now I'm going to define some other graphs, delta k and delta k sharp. You have already seen delta zero. So this is a generalization of that definition of delta zero. So vertex set of these graphs is t minus one dimensional hypercube, discrete hypercube of side n with, as with all these graphs, given two, elements in here to vertices of this discrete hypercube you put a directed edge from a to b if and only if psi sub k of u can change these last coordinates into these last coordinates so before we had k equals zero and psi zero is u inverse and this is exactly the definition i had before so I am extending the definition to psi sub k of u. So I put an edge if psi sub k can change these ai's into these bj's. And similarly, uh, for this other one, I want that this element can change the first coordinates a into the b's. So it somehow it can change these AIs into these BJs when they are in the first positions. So now the graphs all have the same vertex set. And uh, if a permutation is stable, then these two consist only of loops uh, if R and S are sufficiently large. Because if R is greater than or equal to N of U, as we saw, by definition, it means that psi sub r cannot change the last t minus one coordinates. So in these graphs, you only have an arrow from a to a because psi sub k can never change the last t minus one coordinates. And similarly, in this case, s is big enough, greater than or equal to this number, then capital pi sub s cannot change the first t minus one coordinate. So this graph has only loops. Now you do have a um, technical result here, uh, u permutation of the t-dimensional discrete hypercube, k greater than or equal to zero. If delta k of u has a directed path from a to b, then it also has a directed path from b to a. So for these graphs, 
connected components and strongly connected components are the same thing. And similarly for delta K sharp. So now the gist of our argument is showing that in fact, that these graphs delta K are connected one to the other thanks to these operators, RU inverse and L of U. So this is something you show. And so at this point, you're essentially done. Of course, there are many little things that need to be done, but essentially, okay, you know that delta K is this kth power of delta zero, and delta K sharp is this kth power of L sub U applied to delta zero sharp. And that's essentially the result I was talking about. So I want to, uh, should have the time, I hope to uh, have an example. So let's see uh, now if this, this works properly. Let's see. Uh, well, let me see. Uh, that's not what I was expecting. Okay, that's me. And uh, there we go. Ah, it's, oh boy. So I made some mistake here. Uh, let me see. I think I should go here. And. Uh, hmm. Maybe I should, uh, okay, maybe here. Let's see if it works now. Okay, so I hope this is uh, fairly visible. So I had uh, uh, one, two to one, four, four. So our U is, uh, So I have this permutation in my uh, two-dimensional discrete square, uh, four square. So I want to compute uh, delta zero of u. So here t is two. So my graph has vertices n to the t minus one. So the vertices are simply one, two, three, and four. Where do I put a directed edge? I have to look at what second coordinates U, can, U inverse can change. U inverse can change four to one. Here it is. So I put an edge between four and one. U inverse can change one to two. So I put an edge from one to two. U inverse can change two to four. So I put an edge from two to four. Okay. So that would be my delta zero of U. The, sec the second coordinates that you can change. So now let me uh, go to delta one of you. So delta one of you this is I have to apply this operator R u inverse to delta zero. So I have to take every directed edge in this graph and carry that operation. So let's see. I take one, two as my directed edge. So this one here. What do I have to do? I have to stick a Z on the right. I have four possible numbers. So I can stick one to the right or two or three or four. Then I have to apply U inverse. And now I have to 
forget the first element. And these are going to be my edges, my directed edges in delta one of u. Okay, so let's uh, see some of these uh, computations. So one one is a fixed point. So this is one one, forget the first one, it's one. Two one is not a fixed point. Two one with u inverse goes to one two. Now forget the first one, two remains so this is two so i could stop here but let's let's do one more so one two u inverse of one two is four four so this is four four forget the first one i get a four two two is a fixed point so u inverse of two two is two two forget the first one is a two so you get an edge from four to two etc so to produce delta one of u I need to do this for one, two, and then for all the other edges, four, one, and two, four. But I say, look, you don't need to do anything else. You're already done. Why? Because you started with the edge one, two, and this operation already gave you the edge one, two. And my operator is the same, doesn't depend on K. So now when I compute the delta two, it's the same computation. I'm going to have one, two, and I'm going to produce one, two again. So all these graphs delta k are going to have the edge one two so this permutation is not stable you will never get only loops okay so i'll uh, go back now to my talk okay so i see that i'm running out so applications are uh, so very briefly, uh, one thing you would like to do is count these permutations. Uh, you would like to classify them, but maybe just count them. Uh, here are the first few numbers. If R is two, of course, these permutations are difficult to compute because four squared is 16, S16 is a very big group, 16 factorial permutations. So these are the numbers you get. Um, and uh, if you, you know, look at these numbers and take the quotient with the total number of permutations, it's clear it's a very small percentage, a very small fraction of permutations. So we conjectured in our first paper that this actually uh, goes to zero. And this can be proved with the graphs. So if you take the limit of the stable permutations over all of them, if R goes to infinity, the dimension goes to infinity, the limit is zero. And if n, the side of the hypercube goes to infinity, the limit is zero. So if you take a permutation at random, it was not gonna be stable. So I think I will uh, uh, skip this sketch of proof. It's based on the graph. Almost all graphs uh, have uh, these graphs connected. So in, very far from being only loops, they're all connected if you take a permutation at random. Um, some other consequence is, uh, enumeration you can enumerate r cycles that are stable of rank one you get this formula not the prettiest of formulas there are a few summations so this is set of all compositions of r into i parts so some of these is r uh, but it does have some nice consequences so if you choose an r cycle uniformly at random in the discrete square as n goes to infinity the probability that this is stable goes to one almost surely it's going to be stable and uh, maybe i'll conclude by mentioning uh, this one take an r cycle uh, you would like to understand when this is stable a cycle in the discrete square you can associate a directed graph put an edge between i and j i and j now are just numbers between one and r if either AI equals to BJ or AI plus one equals BJ. So it's a very simple graph to construct. It's not recursive, very simple. And you can show that if this is a cyclic, then it's stable for cycles of the discrete square. 
Uh, we thought the converse would be true. It's true for up to four. For up to four, it's stable, but it's not true in general. So for five cycles, you can characterize them. It's going to be stable if and only if this is a cyclic or this guy, which I'm not going to define, but you see it's a quite a simple subset of, of the discrete square uh, coincide with one of those. So I think that um, open problems, what can I say, uh, determine these numbers, uh, um, maybe uh, restricted to permutations of rank one uh, that are involutions maybe, or such that lambda u is an involution, you get these counting problems. You have nothing to do with Kuntz algebras, just count permutations of the discrete square that satisfy this equation or this equation. And uh, if you take permutations of a sentence or a send, then these become well-known numbers. So you just compute them. It's uh, the first one is number of partitions times n factorial. And the second one is number of standard Yann tableau size n. So I, I think I will stop here. Oh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Brenti, for a wonderful talk and quite a recent one. And uh, I really like the illustration of the examples you have given. So uh, is there any question? So there were many questions during the talk, but uh, is there any question from the participants? Somehow. Yeah, yeah, Hanya, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor Francisco. This is very nice. Yes. And interesting. Um, um, I, I just wanted to um, just quickly uh, make sure. So this, um, so this claim of Kunz that um, this classification of you know such automorphisms that preserve or, that, or leave invariant f n and d n and mm -hmm. fix the diagonal. It, it's a combinatorial one. So the combinatorial connection here is uh, the stable permutations, right? Yes, yes. And and you've characterized them in terms of these graphs that um, yes that you showed us, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so um, so I just this is really, really less of a math question, more of an inspiration question. Uh, so what what um, so where did you take inspiration from uh you know in looking to graphs so what what's the you know what's what was yes the right idea so, that took you to graphs or... yes so i i can tell you so of course you you have this size k of you which are uh, as you have seen uh, rather uh, complicated permutations rather cumbersome permutations and you're trying to understand if they can be written as v tensor one if they can be written as v tensor one, then of course they don't change the last coordinate. Right. They're not going to change the last coordinate. And then as you go on, they're not going to change the last two, the last three, et cetera. So this gave us the idea that looking at what this size of k can do in the last coordinates was important. That gave us this idea. And, and that, you know, gave rise to these graphs uh, and uh, and indeed uh, they they were the right object to obtain this characterization uh, uh, not as explicit as you would hope for one would hope for something even more explicit but still they proved to be quite useful right it's very interesting thanks sure yeah uh, is there any other question from the audience I was trying to show myself, but somehow I'm, I, I pressed something <laughs> wrong. So I'm sorry, but I'm here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Brenti, for accepting our invitation and uh, for introducing Kuntz algebras and uh, very interesting stuff. And thank uh, you. I and uh, I really uh, uh, I really hope uh, definitely there are many uh, who are already uh, you fascinated many young minds with, uh, with the problems in enumerative combinatorics. And uh, this is a kind of stuff which people who are working in the enumerative combinatorics are so obsessed with. Yes. And uh, really, really beautiful, really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much.
thank you everyone and uh, i hope uh, in the next uh, john conway series uh, uh, seminar we uh, will join again in the next week uh, when we are going to have a talk from india this time and uh, our next speaker uh, so let me just advertise the next one so our next speaker is uh, professor nina gupta and uh, she's going to talk about something polynomials and power says may they forever rule the world something like that so uh, thank you i hope to uh, have professor brenty once again and uh, hope to have everyone on board in the next week on the same time uh, thank you thank you professor brenty and uh, sure. we will keep you're welcome I, I usually teach at this time so <laughs> it's hard for me to be here <laughs> <laughs> I, I cancelled one lecture today. Yeah. I, will, I hope we will meet once again sometime somewhere. Yes. Also yeah. too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.